Hi, I'm Barbara Fox, and I was trying to figure out how coherent optics change the network. The speeds and feeds of the network are getting faster all the time. It has always been that the layer two protocol, the link layer protocol that forwarded traffic from one device to the next device was what constrained the speeds of the network. So first we had modems, then we had T1E1s that were forwarding traffic over the telephone lines. And for that traffic, we used X25, which is a windowing protocol, meaning that we would send a certain number of frames and then we would wait for them to be acknowledged before we would send any more. And if anything in that window arrived broken, we'd have to retransmit it. And so that helped us to only send as much traffic as was being received successfully. And then as we got better at transmitting and receiving traffic, we developed Frame Relay. And what Frame Relay did was let us send a lot more traffic at better speeds with a committed information, the traffic we were guaranteeing, and then excess traffic. And excess traffic went into the network with a discard eligibility bit set so that if there was congestion at any point in the network, we'd throw that traffic away first. Then we wanted to be able to support voice and video as well as data over the network, basically take voice traffic and put it over the data network. But the problem with that is that voice traffic has to go out immediately. Otherwise, your voice will sound choppy and it'll be hard to have a conversation over the network. And so what ATM developed to do was to really break up the data packets into smaller chunks so that you could send out part of a data packet and then send a voice packet right behind it so that the quality of service was good enough to support voice on the data network. That's because our link speeds weren't fast enough. And if you had a very big data packet, voice packet queued up behind it, that voice packet would become useless. But then we developed gigabit ethernet. And what that did was it made our link speeds very fast. And at that point, we didn't have to worry about a data packet being queued up in front of a voice packet because the voice packet would get out soon enough because the link speeds were high enough. So once gigabit ethernet was developed, that really became the layer two protocol of choice everywhere in the LAN and in the WAN. So at this point, well, the traffic isn't being constrained by the protocol. Now it's being constrained by how fast the optic can send the traffic over the fiber. We have gray fiber and that sends basically one port's worth of traffic over a single, single mode or multi-mode fiber. And that traffic goes maybe 10 kilometers. But fiber is really our most expensive commodity in the network because you have to dig and lay the fiber underground. Sometimes you have to pay for rates of way so that you can lay the fiber in the ground. And so we wanted to make better use of the fiber. And so they developed DWDM. It uses different, more expensive wavelengths, basically, so that you can have 88 wavelengths that go on a single fiber in the C-band and recently they've also opened up the L-band so you can put even more ports worth of data over a single fiber. And so that was developed to let us be able to send lots and lots of traffic. Usually it was used for long haul. And so coherent optics as the transponders get better and better, the link speeds improve. And that's how we make our networks faster these days. When you have transponders, you're not sending ones and zeros anymore, you're sending symbols. So you're sending more packet in the same time frame. How do rotoms work? I'm not an optical person, but this is my simple view of what happens. Basically, if you have a router and it's sending traffic into the rotom, it's either sending a gray wavelength, single mode or multi-mode fiber wavelength in, or it's just sending ethernet in. And that traffic is converted into a colored wavelength, a coherent wavelength, which is basically one of those wavelengths that is on a DWDM link so that you can have multiple wavelengths on the same fiber. That's a coherent wavelength or a colored wavelength. Then there's another card in the Rotom that basically takes all the different colored wavelengths and combines them together and puts them out on a single fiber. So when we have coherent optics, all of the work that gets done in this input card and this transponder card. So the transponder card is really the card that determines how fast your traffic can go, what the quality is of the traffic that's being forwarded. So the transponder card is doing a lot of the work to create those symbols and forward the traffic. Those cards that get removed from the Rotom and actually put into a coherent optic that can be plugged into the router.
Now, not all routers can take coherent optics. You need to have enough power in the router to support the coherent optic. It requires more power than the gray optics. When the coherent optic is in the router, it forwards a colored wavelength into the rotom. And then that wavelength is combined with other wavelengths to go out on a single fiber. So how does that change how we build our networks? You could just have routers that went router to router. Say we had four 400 gig ports that were talking between these two routers. We could mux those wavelengths together, send them out in a single fiber to our next router next hop. So you've got basically 1.6 terabytes of data talking between these two routers. Or we could do the same thing where we actually just put the coherent optics into the router and still plug it into the Rotom network and have Rotom connectivity. So I was trying to figure out which of these options made sense. If we look at how traffic used to flow through the network, service providers really are the on-ramps onto the internet. So service providers provide connectivity to residential users and to business users. In the early days, traffic was really stayed more locally. So a business might have a data center that was also on the same service provider network, may have multiple locations on that service provider's network, but for the most part, all of the connectivity was in the service provider network. Residential users are probably sending email or maybe going to websites, and the websites were really on the CDN networks, like Akamai's network, and those networks were connected into the service provider network. And so residents would get onto the CDN networks via their own local service provider network. But there are times when traffic needs to be exchanged between service providers, right? You want to send email from a person on one service provider's network to someone on another service provider's network. And so we had May East and May West. And what those were are internet exchange points where the service providers would get together, they would put all their routers on a LAN and basically exchange traffic so that we had traffic flowing from one network to another. In the olden days, there was May East and May West, and those were the two big pops. But if we look at traffic today, service providers continue to bring the residential users and businesses onto the internet. But now a lot of the data in the internet, the back end of the internet, is really provided by the hyperscalers. If you're a residential user, you're going to Netflix or Facebook or any of the social networks, and you're accessing all of that traffic is sitting in the cloud in the hyperscalers network. And even at work, if you're using Office 365, you're going to Microsoft's network all day long. All of our apps, you know, Salesforce, Workday, Zoom, those are all in the, all in the cloud. And so we're accessing the cloud all day. So basically the hyperscalers are really providing the data in the network and the service providers are providing the users of the network. Everybody's putting their information into AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud. The service providers and the hyperscalers are now meeting at these internet exchange points. So what does that look like? So this website has the internet exchange points for the whole world. I zoomed in on the US. You can see that there are a lot of internet exchange points, but they're still at the highly densely populated parts of the, of the country. And then I kind of wanted to see what bandwidth looked like in the network, but I, I couldn't really find that. So what I decided to use was just regular traffic, our traffic. So this is Google traffic at 525 on Eastern time. And you can see that there's a lot of traffic going through the main thoroughfares. There's congestion at different points of the network at the location centers. And so what I did was I overlaid the POP network with the traffic network. And you can see that there are lots of POPs really where the, where the congestion is with the car traffic. I decided to blow up Boston. So Boston has three internet exchange points, one in Boston, one in Somerville, and one in Lowell. So you have all this traffic out here, and it's being basically backhauled to these three locations. So say I have a router in Greenfield. That router is going to service all the local traffic to Greenfield and forward it to its next hop. So let's say that the next hop is in Orange. So this router in Orange is going to service all the local traffic in Orange. And then it needs enough switching capacity to be able to switch the traffic from Greenfield towards the pop. 
So it has an, enough bandwidth to support its local traffic and enough capacity to support switching traffic from Greenfield. And then say our next top is Gardner. Now this router in Gardner has to support all the local traffic, and then it needs enough switching capacity to be able to forward traffic from both Orange and Greenfield. So you see, as you get closer to the POPs, you're gonna be forwarding more and more switching traffic in addition to the local traffic that you're servicing. As you get closer to the POP, the link speeds are gonna to have to get higher and higher because a lot of what you're doing is really just switching traffic from a previous router. Now, if you have a Rotom network, it's a little bit different. Now you have connectivity going through the underlying Rotom network, but your IP connectivity is pretty simple. Basically, each one of your routers is connecting to a router that's close to the POP. And your IP connectivity is, is pretty simple. You're using the underlying Rotom network to support multiple wavelengths. And so you're able to aggregate because you can add more and more wavelengths with the fiber, it's not limited to the number of wavelengths that's going from router to router. So you can add more wavelengths to support the bandwidth of these routers connecting to routers close to the pop. And then if you have your older routers that are still going through the transponders, they're still gonna use the same underlying Rotom network and they're gonna to connect to you know, routers with transponders at the other end. And you can still have routers connecting into another router. You can still use the same routed optical network connectivity, but you're gonna really wanna have the Rotom network underlay. And so this made sense to me because at this point, I think that you're sizing your router for the amount of local traffic and you don't have to worry about the amount of transit traffic because you know, in the beginning, sure, it's easy to create a routed optical network that supports all the traffic in your network. But over time, as your traffic bandwidth grows, the routers closer, the transit routers closer to the POP are going to have to get bigger and bigger as the traffic that they're aggregating from these other routers grows. And these are router ports, which are not really cheap. So the other thing that you have to think about when you're managing the network that has optical Ethernet and IP interfaces is that you need access to the coherent optics in the routers because they have to manage power levels for some reason. It's physics and I don't understand it, but you basically have to balance power levels in the network. And so you need to be able to manage that in the routers. And I said that we have all these colored wavelengths get, that get mucks together. Each wavelength has to be different. And so you have to be able to manage what wavelengths exist and what wavelengths are free. So you need to keep track of all that. And then because we're using a fiber network in the ground, fiber travels in conduit. So you'll have multiple fibers in the same conduit. What you want to do is make sure that your IP interfaces, you know, your paths through the IP network, understand the underlying fiber network. And so there's these, these things called shared risk link groups, SRLGs, and that information gets propagated up to layer three, up to the IP networks, so that they understand that if they wanna have one path and have a, the best diverse path, that they're not going through the same fiber conduits. And so you have to take information from layer zero and push it up to layer three. So anyway, if you have any comments, I'd be interested in hearing them. And thanks for your time. Take care.